this morning, I wanted to share with you a few Father's Day quotes. Uh, some of these were some of these were by famous people. Some were not, um, but some of them are very interesting. They were talking about their own fathers. Some of them are funny, uh, but uh, I, I just wanted to share some of week because I, I thought they were kind of cute. Um, one of them is, I remember the time I was kidnapped and they sent a piece of my finger to my father. He said he wanted more proof. <laughs> that was Rodney Dangerfield, so you know. <laughs> I gave my father $100 and said, buy, buy yourself something that will make your life easier. So he went out and bought a present for my mother. <laughs> That's wisdom right there. I've been to war, I've raised twins. If I had a choice, I'd rather go to war. <laughs> I know that if my mom fell and screamed for help, my dad would jump right up to rescue, rescue her as soon as it was halftime. You can tell what was the best year of your father's life because they seemed to freeze that clothing style and ride it out. Now, y'all didn't laugh as much about that one because that. <laughs> I love my dad because even though he has Alzheimer's, he remembers the important things. He can't remember my name, but last week he told me exactly how much money I owe him. When you're young, you think your dad is Superman. Then you grow up and realize he's just a regular guy who wears a cape. <laughs> think about that for a minute. <laughs> dad taught me everything I know. Unfortunately, he didn't teach me everything he knows. That was Al Unser. The worst thing that can happen to a man is his wife comes home and he has lost the child. How did everything go? Great. We're playing hide and seek and he's winning. <laughs> Just once on Father's Day, somebody got it. <laughs> Just once on Father's Day, I wish my kids would give me a number one dad mug instead of one with my actual ranking. For Father's Day, we got my dad a t-shirt that says, Do Not Resuscitate. He wears it whenever mom takes him to the ballet. <laughs> you got to love dads. At my wedding, when I tripped on my wedding dress and fell flat on my face, dad said, Don't worry, you'll do better next time. <laughs> mm. I got my dad a GPS for Father's Day. Now someone other than my mom can tell him where to go. <laughs> I would give my dad what he, what he really wants on Father's Day, but I can't afford to move out yet. <laughs> I've, never, I've never been totally sold on the concept of Father's Day for one thing, it was officially declared a national holiday by Richard Nixon, so it might not even be legal. <laughs> when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. <laughs> Those of you who are not 21 yet, you just remember that quote. That was by Mark Twain. You remember that quote. He was talking about how smart his dad really was and how dumb he was. I think most of us who are over 21 realize that there's probably not a, not a more true quote out there than that. Dads are pretty special, aren't they? Yes, they are. You know, they're, they're special in God's eyes too. And I'd like to thank all of you fathers this morning and all of you father figures, uh, like mothers, uh, even, if you're, even if you're not a father, if you're a stepfather or, or you, you have that role, 
you're influencing someone. And so um, I always keep that in mind. But I would like to thank all of you and just tell you that we do appreciate you. God appreciates you. And today I'm going to challenge you. Today's message is going to be challenging to you, fathers. I went kind of easy on, on the mothers, but I'm going, to, I'm going to be a little harder on you guys today. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I'm, I'm preaching to myself, but I'm, preaching, I'm going to preach this today because I know you can take it. You're tough. But we need to be reminded of the place that God has put us in as fathers and father figures. So if you would, uh, turn with me to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. We're going to revisit this first incident very briefly. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, for most of you, I'm sure, like a lot of the scriptures we read, you don't need to read it because you know what it says. But I, I just want you to pay special attention to the first part of this verse because this, this sets the tone for what, what Paul is going to talk about in just a moment in his letter to the Corinthians. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the first part of this is, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other. That's it. That's all I want you to know about that. Because that in itself tells us everything that we need to know about the rest of that story. The serpent, Satan, was more crafty than any other. Now from that story we know what follows. We know that, we know that uh, Eve was deceived. Satan is crafty. He is deceitful. And he is very cunning. He is a formidable adversary right from the beginning. But that's how he is. That's how Satan is. That's still how he operates today. Eve was deceived. But we've got to keep in mind before we start blaming Eve too much. You know, a lot of people when they read this they like to play the, the blame game. You know, whose fault was it? Nobody ever blames himself. But if we read this, if we go through this and read it, we understand and we have to keep in mind that it was Adam who talked to the Lord. It was Adam who got the instruction from the Lord about what to do and what not to do there in the Garden of Eden. And so before we start blaming Eve for being deceived, let's look at what Adam did. Adam was the one who communicated with God. How many of you have seen that movie, Cool Hand Luke? Most people have. Now, there's one quote in that almost everybody knows. I, I, as soon as, when I read uh, this about, uh, about the serpent and this whole thing between the communication problem, I couldn't help but think of that line. What we have here is a failure to communicate. That's what happened between Adam and Eve. There was a failure to communicate. But maybe that's how Satan slipped in because he knew, he, he knew that there was a weakness there. And it's hard to see that there was a weakness bound up in perfection. But that's what Satan does. Satan goes to, to that weakest point. And in this instance, he found a loophole. He said, you know what, I'm going to go in there and just deceive Eve just a little bit. So perhaps there was some miscommunication on Adam's part to tell her the whole story of what God had told him. Perhaps this is what made Eve more vulnerable to the corruption and that temptation. And from here we know the story. From here, this is where sin came in to the picture. And from that point, man fell. At that point, death entered into the human race. But men, I want you to 
think about this. Fathers, men, I want you to think about this. This is why it's important that we need to communicate to our children. That's why we need to communicate effectively, not just to our own children, but to other children, people who might be looking up to us. You know, there's kids everywhere who don't have fathers. Or if they do, they're not in the picture. And they look up to somebody or they need somebody to look up to. That's why we need to be effective in our communication with our children about what is right and what is not. Because the devil is cunning. And they're going to come in contact with people who also effectively communicate just like Satan did. They're crafty. They're deviant and they're cunning. And guess what? Your child's going to come in contact to them one day. A lot of them are already in contact with them. They're in the school system. They're in our educational system. A lot of them is in our homes. And so we need to know how to communicate effectively with our children. Do we do it from a worldly standpoint? No. Where should we come from? It should, for, it should be from a biblical standpoint. Somebody was holding up a Bible back there. That's right. It's a biblical standpoint. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is Paul. Paul's talking about... Now, Paul started the Corinthian church. Now, he started this church right in the midst of... The, you know, Corinth was a very evil city. Very, very evil. They worshipped every god under the sun. They did unimaginable things, things that you know, we, we can't even fathom. Paul went there and started a church. Now this was a fledgling church. Paul sent more than one letter there, obviously, 2 Corinthians. But people think that this could be actually uh, on further down the line. This could be a fourth letter. So there's debate about exactly how many letters he did send. But obviously the Corinthians had problems. But they also had promise. Because Paul talks a lot about, in, the, in these two letters, about how special they are. The spiritual gifts that they all contain. And he's trying to get them to do things from the good point of view, from a biblical standpoint. Alright, and so he's talking to them here. And I think, I think this here is how we need to address fathers. This is how we need to address our children. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11... Verse 3, starting with verse 3, Paul says, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He said, I am afraid. There were false apostles coming in. There were false apostles coming in doing something different than he had done. And he was afraid that these false apostles were going to come in and lead them astray. Now as fathers, you men out there, let me ask you, do you want your kids led astray from what you've taught them as a Christian father? You can say it. No. Let me ask you again. Do you want your children to be led astray from the biblical example that you're giving. Do you want them to be led astray? No. no. You do not. You want them led from a biblical standpoint. You're trying to teach them as a biblical father, knowing about your heavenly father. And so no, we don't want anybody to come in. So like Paul, we're afraid. We're afraid that these people are going to come in and lead our kids astray. But we don't have to be afraid. And I don't know that Paul was truly afraid. Paul was very courageous. It don't take long to read about him to figure that out. But he gives them some advice. In verse 4. He says, For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Hmm. All right, so let's talk about that for a minute. These false apostles came in and they proclaimed another Jesus. Now this, this scripture sounds awfully familiar to what's going on today. You don't have to go too far. You can go in a lot of churches and find out that there are places preaching 
another Jesus. There's some of them probably not too far down the road that are preaching another Jesus. This Jesus I'm talking about is they don't believe in a heavenly Jesus. They don't believe in a resurrected Jesus. They believe in a historical Jesus and they like to talk about that, but they will not mention a resurrected Jesus because they don't believe in His resurrection. If we don't believe in His resurrection, like Paul says in his first letter in 1 Corinthians, if we don't believe in Jesus Christ's resurrection, then we have nothing to build our faith on. So Paul, Paul's telling them, these people that are coming in, he said, if they come in and do that, you're accepting it readily enough. Now as a heavenly father, as an earthly father, our children should be prepared to not accept that readily enough. Amen? Amen? We ought to have the guts to prepare them and be honest with them about what's in the world. Let them know that there are people who preach another Jesus. Paul also said they were receiving a different spirit. Now this, this one's kind of strange because we don't think about this one too much. How can you receive a different spirit? Well, the Apostle John talks in one of his letters. He, talks, he tells us as Christians, he said to test every spirit that comes your way because every spirit that comes to you is not from God. The devil is roaring about like a lion. He's roaming around, roaring like a lion, trying to find prey in which he can devour. You know who the prey is? That prey is your children. That prey is a weak mind. That prey, that prey is someone that is not built on the foundations of Christ. That's who Satan's looking for. And if we're not building our children up in that, then they're going to be easy prey. As fathers, do you want that? As fathers, do you want that? So he was telling them that they, if you receive a different spirit than the one that you receive, there are spirits. Paul goes on to talk about this in just a moment, and I'll talk about it in just a moment. But we're fighting a spiritual war every day. And we need to teach our kids that. Have any of you ever received a different spirit? Have you ever heard that little voice inside of you telling you to do something that absolutely goes against what God says? Do you think that's God talking to you? Absolutely not. That's what he's talking about, receiving a different spirit. The Apostle John says, test all the spirits. If you get a word like that, you get a thought like that, you take it and you weigh it against the word of God. That's your measuring system. That's how you know if it's truly from God or not. And then he goes on to say, accepting a different gospel. Now that's something that's also being preached. You know, there's two different ways that this is going around. One to the extreme and one not to the extreme. To the extreme, I guess, if you've ever watched the news very much, you've seen Westboro Baptist Church. They're extremely dogmatic. I, and I hesitate to even call them a church because they teach bigotry. They teach hate. That's not what the gospel teaches. The gospel teaches us to love sinners. You know why? Because we're all sinners. We love ourselves, don't we? We do. Now, the Bible also teaches us not to accept sin. And so this is where it goes to the other extreme. We have churches that are preaching, well, everybody's all right. Do what you want to, and you'll still get to heaven. It's called universalism. It's running rampant in churches today. You know, most of these preachers that you find on TV, now some of them are good and some of them ain't, but if all you ever hear is just an encouraging word and there is no substance to that message, then you probably didn't get a gospel message. Now, I'm not trying to pick on any of them because, like I said, there are some good ones. But there are some 
some of them who, who can't even mention Jesus' name. That is a different gospel than what Paul taught. That is a different gospel than what we've been taught. We have to make our kids aware of these things. We need to make our kids aware that a, if there is a different Jesus being taught, if, there is a, if they're receiving different spirits, if they're accepting a different gospel, they need to know the difference. They need to know what is fake and what is real. And you know who they learn that from the most? From us fathers. Even though kids predominantly spend more time with their moms, guess who they're influenced by the most? Fathers. Fathers influence their kids more than anybody else. Even if they're not present, that influence is still there and it still carries. That's why it's so important. But this is happening right now. Right now, this very hour, there are people teaching things that are contrary to the Word of God. Lord, have mercy on them. But Satan is going to attack those weak links. In most cases today in the church, and I hate to say this, but fathers have become the weakest link. How do I know that? All you got to do is look at the activity in the church. Men, fathers, are the least involved in the aspects of the church for the most part. Especially, especially in biblical training and biblical teaching. I know that's hard to, like I tell my Bible study group when I give them a hard word, go ahead and take a deep swallow. I just did. That's hard to accept. For us men, that's hard to accept. Because, you know, we're, we're hard-headed. We think we know everything. But we don't. A lot of men have failed. They have failed their children. Because they don't take as much importance. They don't think about the role that they play in their local church and also into the church as a whole. I've said this before that today we live in the most biblically illiterate generation in history. But I also just told you that fathers are the least involved in the churches today. Do you think there is a link between that? I believe so. If you're uncomfortable, good, so am I. I'm not telling you this to try and shine a light on anyone. I'm not telling you this because I think you need to hear it. Lord knows I need to hear it. But it's the truth. Men, I want to tell you, the day, for those of you who have children, the day that you became a father, God gave you a divinely appointed mission. And that is to teach your children the ways of your Heavenly Father. That is a divine appointment. If you read the Bible, men are given leadership roles for a reason. Now ladies, don't think I'm discounting this. Mm -mm. I'm not discounting your role in this. Because you go back and read, you're side by side with us. But men, you have been given a divinely appointed mission by God himself to be the leader of your family, the spiritual leader of your family. And if you are not doing that, then you are falling behind. You know that saying, it's hard to lead from behind? That's especially true in the spiritual world. Because if you're behind, Satan's in front of you. You know, there's things, you know, we might be able to face physical trials in this life, but your kids are going to find out at some point that it's more than physical trials. Ladies and gentlemen, we fight a spiritual war. 
We fight against principalities, evil spirits. We fight against that every single day. Fathers, you especially fight against that every single day. It is your divine appointment to combat this by knowing the Word of God and to know what to do. Turn with me to Ephesians and we'll finish with this. Ephesians chapter 6. And you know this, there's Bible schools, you know, uh, talking about this, and there's Bible studies talking about this. Most people know this. But how true it is. Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 10. This is talking about spiritual battle. This is not talking about physical battle. Spiritual battle. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able, may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You know, a lot of people might know each aspect of that. You may have memorized it. But the thing that it doesn't tell you is how to put it on. You know what your instruction manual is for putting it on? It's this right here. God's holy word. His holy word tells you how to put on the spiritual armor so you can go out and combat different things. So you can go out and you can combat the evil forces that are going to attack you day in and day out and especially attack your children. Fathers, how many of you read this? Dads, how many of you brought a Bible today? How many brought a physical Bible? Thank you. If you don't have a Bible, see me, I'll personally buy you one. If you don't know what kind to use, I'll tell you which kind to use. If you like a better kind, I'll help you get that one. But for God's sake, bring a Bible. This is the best thing that you can carry day in and day out for your children to know that you're reading it. This is the Word of God. This is the instruction manual that tells you how to fight the devil. If you want your children to know how to fight the devil, then you've got to show them by reading this right here. They've got to see that you've put on your spiritual armor. They've got to see that you are the first line of defense between them and the devil. We may not always get it right, but don't let that stop you. You think I've gotten everything right? No, I'm far from it. I'm still learning. If you're still breathing, you're still learning. How many people, how many fathers in here have been a Christian for over 50 years? We got a few in here. Thank you. Are you still learning? Amen. Amen. Thank you for still learning. Fathers, we have a tremendous job. There's an author named Steve Farrar. He says this. Fathers are to sons and daughters what blacksmiths are to swords. It is the job of the blacksmith not only to make the sword, but also to maintain its edge of sharpness. It is the job of the father to keep his son or daughter sharp and save him or her from the dullness of foolishness. He gives his son or daughter that sharp edge through discipline. I'm talking about not physical, but spiritual discipline. Fathers, we sharpen the blades of our children. 
so that they also might wield that double-edged sword that is able to cut down to the marrow. That's called the Word of God. Men, fathers, it's high time that we took on that divine appointed mission that God has given every single one of us to be leaders and to be examples to our children. God doesn't want earthly men. God wants kingdom men. You've been divinely called. Pick up the phone and answer. Let's stand for a closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for teaching us. We thank you for those men who came before us, who taught us and disciplined us in the Spirit. We thank you for those who were influences to us that read your word, who showed us by example how to handle things. And as I said, Lord, we don't always get it right. And we never will. But as long as we trust you and, and our kids see that, those who look up to us see that, and as long as they see that we always go back to the word, we always go back as an example to be like Jesus, that's what we've got to do. So help us to do that. Help us to just be better examples. Lord, you are a good, good father. You gave us your son, your only son, to die on the cross for our sins, to take on all of our sin as ugly as it was and still is. You took it. And we thank you that you sent him for that. And we thank you that we have his spirit, that he might live in us if we accept him. Lord, when we face these spiritual battles, we don't do it alone. You fight our battles for us. Sometimes, Lord, we just need to get out of the way and just let you fight for us. Especially as fathers. Let us do things your way. Let us do things in your will. Lord, I know if we do that as fathers, our kids and those who look up to us, they'll be all right. But let us do that today. Let us stay in your word each and every day. And Father, again, we thank you so much for being a good, good father. We pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.